Aloha. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. It's Trump week and we have a fa uh, we have a full agenda and we are going to get right to it. Um, first topic of the day is the interview with Jonathan Swan and President Trump. The title of the show today is 156,000 COVID deaths. Trump, it is what it is. And uh, I'm going to jump right into that because it was an interview for the ages. I don't think it's going to be easily forgotten. Um, we're going to unpack that interview and um, amongst other items here on the agenda. But let's go right to it, because when uh, Jonathan Swan was interviewing Donald Trump, um, this is how it went. Donald Trump said, right now, I think it's under control, meaning the virus. And then Jonathan Swan said, over a, a thousand American deaths are dying each and every day. And then Donald Trump said, they're dying. That's true. And you have, well, it, it is what it is, but that doesn't mean we aren't doing everything we can. It's under control as much as you can control it. I, I think that that statement, it is what it is, speaks highly to Donald Trump's obtuse attitude about COVID, how to address it. Uh, we all know the history of how this whole thing began back in late February, early March. Donald Trump's insistence that it was, well, first off, it was a, a democratic hoax, a hoax designed to bring down his popularity, to upset the financial markets that uh, he desperately needs to have a strong economy in order to be reelected. And then in mid-March, he started to take it a little bit seriously, but he kept saying, it's just gonna disappear, it's gonna go away. Um, Donald Trump later admitted that he's a cheerleader. That's who he is. And he has to put a, a, a rosy, fresh picture on everything, despite the continuing and ever mounting deaths of American citizens. Um, and here we are today with 156,000 deaths and Donald Trump in his most compassionate attempt is to just say, it is what it is. I think that's gonna be on his political tombstone. And we'll find out here in 90 days because the election is just around the corner. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. Uh, welcome everyone. Today we have Stephanie Dalton, Cynthia Sinclair, and Winston Welch. Good, 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 good morning, everyone. Aloha. Uh, Stephanie, let's go right to you. Um, do you think this statement will stick? Do you think this is the one where people will identify Donald Trump and how obtuse he is and how distant he is emotionally from thousands of Americans dying? Um, will this one stick? It is what it is. Well, I uh, appreciate that question. It's a very uh, important. And, and that statement, it is what it is, competes with you can have any virus test you want and find out if you have it. So that goes back to also compete with what, what could go on that tombstone, as you say. But I think that importantly, it tells us about what's been pointed out as his lack of empathy and his inability to uh, reach out and uh, open his, in, a, in an open-hearted way about the human, humane considerations of, of our losses. Uh, we haven't done enough national grieving for these people who are uh, really uh, unattended to in so many ways. Um, I certainly think CNN is running uh, little pieces about these people, people's lives. And I certainly appreciate that we need so much more of that. But John, our president is incapable of relating to that reality for so many in the country now, families. It's just thousands, hundreds of thousands of people because with every person, there's a huge family of friends and colleagues. And it's an enormous number that needs to be, uh, we need to mourn and we need to celebrate um, their lives. Um, I also wanted to say that, it, thank you for the British Axios interviewer, Jonathan Swan, I really liked that he tried to actually 
be on task in this interview and, and be on task in the ways of holding uh, our leaders' uh, feet to the fire here. What's the evidence? How do you know that? Where does it come from? He really did try to get his resources, his, his sites uh, to, sh to, to draw the president's attention to what, what's, what's the evidence here? Where's your backup? And of course, the president did try to do that. And I think that it, it further illuminated how uh, incompetent and how limited is his understanding of, of what are these topics and what's the meaning of the data and how do you think about this? He's only searching for self-justification, things that will help him <clears throat> in his PR status and not about what we really need him to do, which is understand yeah. how important the Let's, data let is. Let me take a little slight stroll down memory lane and that was the day or so right after our last show where Donald Trump held his, you know, his COVID press conference and what we saw Donald Trump doing is, again, as you said, he's not capable of empathy or, or sympathy, I, for that matter. Um, so what he, what he launched into was the fact that Dr. Fauci was part of the administration. Dr. Fauci works for Donald Trump. Yet, for some reason, Dr. Fauci's approval numbers on how he would handle the crisis uh, rated far, far greater in the polls than Donald Trump. And the only thing Donald Trump could really do is is whine, whine about his his lower numbers. And he actually took the time to say, I guess nobody likes me. And, and you know, what self what self pity during a, a, a pandemic crisis with the the deaths of well, last week, it was one hundred and fifty one thousand. Um, and Donald Trump has the energy and, and no no empathy to talk about the true numbers of deaths and how tragic that is to this nation. Uh, and all he can he could render up and serve up is, I guess nobody likes me. Um, I find that pathetic. Well, but, I agree. I agree. It was truly pathetic, but it's also chilling and and frightening and terrifying uh, because it further illuminates his limitations and what he's capable of doing, which is a good PR job, a con man job. But he's he's not able to help us. We need help. We when I think I think that was really uh, in the Jonathan Swan interview, very, very um, highlighted when it came to the discussion about um, the testing and the percentage of deaths to test versus the percentage of deaths to the population. And so with that, uh, Cynthia, I'd like to ask you what your impression of, of about that interaction with Jonathan Swan about the charts that Donald Trump was handing them. And I got to tell you something, if you looked at those charts, it looked like it was for a fourth grader just learning about how to graph a bar chart. You had four large, you know, two inch thick graph bars in four different colors. And that was that was the graph. And I think the staff did it that way. So Donald Trump could get his arms around it because anything um, more complex and it just wasn't going to go through. Uh, what was your impression about Donald Trump's inter interchange with Jonathan Swan? about the graphs, the charts, and Donald Trump's belief that uh, how the United States is doing so much better than the rest of the world uh, than um, the media is letting on to be. Well, you could just see him sort of get more and more disheveled as, as the, you know, Axios, as John and Swan kept sticking to the facts, right? And, the more he stuck to the facts, the more Trump sort of seemed to just sort of disintegrate around it because um, he couldn't keep up because he doesn't know. And he, you know, he's still flashing his little papers that he's got that aren't even clearly marked as to which country is which. And, you know, there's only four countries obviously that are supposedly represented on this graph that he has, but he never even explained which countries they were. Um, so his little graph was so inadequate that, and then he tries to tell Jonathan Swan, well, you can't do that. And he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> well, clearly Jonathan, uh, clearly Donald Trump was flummoxed. He's not used to the hardball follow-up question because most, most journalists don't ask the follow-up hard questions because they're worried to be about not being called upon again in the press briefings. So they, they, so they, they don't follow up with, 
you know, a, a full analysis of what's being discussed at the moment. And this time, Jonathan Swan did it. And I think Donald Trump was taken, a, taken aback. He was on his heels. And, and I don't think he would have expected it. I agree. I think so. And I think the people that he calls on at his press briefings are actually people he already knows are in his camp. Because it's pretty rare that you see him call on anybody else. Um, every once in a while, you know, he'll call on somebody else. But he cuts them short. And he doesn't even answer the questions sometimes if he doesn't like the question. So I think it's all rather staged at the press conference. And he didn't have a chance to do that staging with this um, interview. And in the same way with the Chris Wallace um, one that we just watched a few weeks ago. Um, and he tried to kind of, you know, no, you can't say that. No, this is the truth. And same thing, he just attacked Chris Wallace on the spot. Well, you know, you're, if you're a journalist, you should expect it. And you're not, you know, you're not made out of uh, gingerbread. You're made out of, you know, you're made of stronger stuff. And you should be able to take that and, and respond to it. Um, I, I, think, I think Jonathan Swan did a pretty good job on this. Mm. And I, I don't think Donald Trump was ready for it. And particularly regarding um, why Donald Trump doesn't get it. He doesn't get the fact that we're not winning this war on the virus. He doesn't get the fact that we could do everything we can and we're doing everything we can. He doesn't get that because we're not doing everything we can. We're far from it. And so, you know, in Donald Trump's mind, I'm, I'm doing the best job. I'm a wartime president and no one's doing a better job than the United States. So, um, all right, let me switch over to Winston. Good morning, Winston. Um, okay. Hey, we just got a question in and the question from this particular viewer says, the, ask the following. Why doesn't Donald Trump just fire Fauci and get rid of the criticism, get rid of the contradiction of statements? Uh, you know, he took on Dr. Brix this week and, and called her pathetic. Um, why doesn't he just fire the critics and just let him run the show as he sees fit? I, I, it's an excellent question, and I'm sure it's brought up every single day in the White House is why don't we get rid of the one guy who's reasonably telling the truth to the American public. I, I, I don't know why they, they haven't done that. The, I mean, the Axios interview, I think, really shows uh, someone who's out of control and, and in decline at a minimum. Um, and, and like Cynthia said, that he was just unable to really respond to these questions coherently. And when I saw that bar graph, uh, Jimmy Fallon did an interesting, uh, humorous, sadly humorous take on this, where he said, oh, that was actually just from your printer um, testing itself, you know. <laughs> but it, it, when he said at one that. point that, uh, the, that the U.S., uh, that the world, uh, the, the U.S. had lowered, lowered number of deaths than the world, um, it, you know, or something like th to that effect, you realize he was off base in this. I don't think they're going to let him have another interview. Yeah. He had had a reasonably friendly interview uh, with Jonathan Swan earlier, so I think they thought he was a safe bet and would portray him in a, in a good light, and maybe he was he liked the foreign accent. I don't know. Um, uh, not foreign accent, but a different English-speaking accent but from Australia. I think he's from Australia, isn't he? Uh, but maybe he liked that, and they thought this was safe, but as soon as he started um, in on some of these things, it didn't matter where they turned. It was just disaster after disaster. Um, and as he brought up these things about uh, the election um, being postponed or uh, it is what it is that, like you said, that could go underneath the, the, the Bible holding um, uh, photo shoot that we had a month ago. And, you know, what, what struck me is as I was thinking about this and, and wondering the, the, the topics we were going to discuss this week, because there's enough just in a day. We, we, don't, we don't have to go back a week. Going back a week in time with this administration is like going back a, a century for other presidents. It's scandal and destruction of our values and norms. And it really makes me feel like we have been in a, 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 a nonstop onslaught of our values, of our norms, of what we expect from leaders. So the bar is so low now that when this man has a performance like this, it will be dismissed by the time we get around here next week. We won't remember it because there will be so many other things that will have happened between now and then. But hopefully this will sink in a little bit more into the consciousness of people that watch this and say, 
you know, Chris Wallace got him on, uh, is it an elephant or a cat, um, you know, type question. But this one here, hopefully, you know, an ending with the, uh, is John Lewis, what do you think about John Lewis? He says, oh, there were good civil rights leaders on both sides. I think that the, the, the interview was a disaster. They're going to keep him locked away until the end of the, um, the election, if we have the election. Um, you know, I, I well, think let, me, I, let me, I think you raised some very good points. And I, I, I want to go back to the data, the graphs, and the, 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 the point that they're so simplistic. Um, I'm going to go back to what I said last week um, and quote and read this quote from Mary Trump. It's on the back of her book uh, about Donald Trump. And I think it plays exactly into the problem of why Donald Trump doesn't understand the true nature of, of COVID and the, and the, the 157,000 deaths. I think it, this all plays into it. I'm going to read this quote one more time because I think it, it shows where we're at. And it says the following. Today, Donald Trump is as much as he was at three years old, incapable of growing, learning, or evolving, unable to regulate his emotions, moderate his response, or take in and synthesize information. I just don't think he can do it. And I think that's, where, that's why this country is in one of the worst countries in the world as far as combating its COVID virus. And I think it's a fat, sad comment that that's where we're at. Uh, but that's where we're at. Well, hopefully, you know, and I was just reading the paper this morning, it said in Hawaii, 30% of folks here are still planning on voting for Donald Trump at this time. I think it was 57% uh, Biden. And it said Donald Trump, a Republican. And I thought, he's not a Republican, number one, but and a Republican of old, um, you know, the, the four years, let's say four years ago. Um, but it's still 30% of people are, are bamboozled by whatever he's, he's selling. He's still a great salesperson that you have. And that's in, Hawaii, that's in liberal Hawaii, but in the main, in mainland America, we just have to hope that these interviews that, that when he says he wants to delay the elections, um, you know, that, so you probably want to get to it later, but about the mail-in voting. And so now Florida is okay because they've got it down there, but the rest of the nation doesn't have it because he thinks Florida is going to work. Uh, so COVID is so controlled that we should send back our kids, but we should postpone the election. It, it, it all doesn't, it doesn't add up. But when you listen to these discrete pieces of information and sound bites, um, you get a different story. But in a long interview like this with, um, with Axios you, and Chris Wallace, you can see everything put together and say, we're in very serious trouble here, folks. And hopefully folks in the military and other branches of the government and everywhere else are saying, no matter what, we can't have this fellow ostensibly leading the nation again. It's so detrimental for our well-being. Your lips to God's ears and hopefully in 90 days or less, we'll find out that answer. See. Thank you. Yeah. Stephanie, um, real quick, how do you think Donald Trump handled uh, the inquiry about John Lewis and the fact that John... Lewis, who is, you know, the premier uh, statue and figurehead of the civil rights movement. Uh, and Donald Trump says, I don't know him. I don't know him. That was a direct quote. I don't know him. Um, he didn't come to my inauguration, so I don't know him. Well, his, this is so duplicitous in that he didn't know him, but he knew he wasn't at any of his events. So he was perfectly clear as to what John was attending and not attending. So um, there's so much facade here, as we've said, in this self-promotion and in his PR and what we refer to often, I think, as the con man. I mean, so he's all about just, just putting together all of these scraps and presenting them in ways that he thinks serve his best interests, which of course do not because his best interests are the same as the country's and he hasn't been able to step up to that. So I've, I find it sad very sad and um, that he has again, as you pointed out before, not only no empathy, but no sympathy, no respect for somebody who has done so much to, to promote um, civil rights and, and suffered physically, personally. Well, I, I, I think what is amazing is, you know, they always say it's timing's everything. You know, here we had the, not long ago, the death of George Floyd. We have the Black Lives Matter movement 
and trying to transform police departments and those things that which are embedded in society and try to root those out that are not giving us an even playing field for all races, uh, all genders, all sexes, all orientations. We're trying to, trying to, or that's the hope, is to level the playing field. And during this environment, Donald Trump just says, he didn't come to my inauguration. I don't know who he is. Um, I just find it how petty, how petty of our president to basically discount this, this man who was paramount in the civil rights movement to just dismiss him um, summarily as such. Well, he's not there for these topics. He has never been there. He and his father had these issues with New York early on because of, of the housing uh, you know, discrimination that they participated in. He has just not been there. I mean, at one level, you can think, well, he's a, he is 70 something something years old. And so he is a man of his time. He goes back a long way where they thoughts and biases were different then. So, but the problem is that as a man in the country, as a citizen, American citizen, he never made any progress uh, as the country has made progress and that he should have participated in or could have or did participate in, but it didn't take hold. I think more evidence that there's no change, there's no growth. So since he's been president, that, that that could have been a woke moment, like, oh, maybe I need to think about this bigger picture. No, he it's not gonna happen. Do it. Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Hey, Cynthia, did you find it a little bit? I, I don't have the dictionary with me, but I'm pretty sure I know what the, the word hypocrite means. Did you think it was a little hypocritical that Donald Trump has been blithering and, and, and pontificating that the evils of mail-in ballots will rig the election and deny him a, a victory if a mail-in system is used uh, throughout the United States. And then by miracle, uh, lo and behold, Florida is an exception to that because uh, they, they've done it right in the past. And by gosh, someone whispered in my ear that Donald, Mr. President, most of your votes are going to come from seniors who go mail-in ballot. So magically now Florida is okay, but I'm still going to maintain a lawsuit against Nevada to prevent them from mail-in voting. Uh, your thoughts and impressions, please. Well, I think what he's doing is he's trying to set the stage for um, his ability to be able to contest whatever the election is. Of course, if it's in his favor, he's not going to do anything. But He's setting the stage for that. Now, I want you to go back to what state was it that had the worst possible history of this sort of thing was Florida in the Bush campaign and a few other primaries. Florida had a terrible, terrible record of having good, you know, uh, trustworthy elections. So to hold up Florida just says to me, I've got the secretary of state in the palm of my hand. So we're going to trust Florida because it's all Republican and I can manipulate the numbers. And I've been saying this for a long time, we know he's going to cheat, okay? So exactly how is the question? Now, I think one of the reasons he first stood against mail-in ballots was because he had already had a plan in order to cheat with the software that, that's coming from China and some of it is coming through a Russian oligarch's company. That was Michigan that just found out about that in 2019 and shut it down. So we know that Russia's still trying to get in there. We know that these, these patents were obtained by Ivanka Trump and they're both, tab it's the tabulation software is what she got the, the, um, the what you call the uh, patents for. So all of that adds up to, sounds to me like that's how he was going to cheat, was through the numbers. He's going to manipulate the numbers. Well, well, now he won't be able to because we'll have paper ballots. And so that's why he's against it, at least my own opinion. So beyond the loyal 38 to 42% base that doesn't care what he says, they'll just vote for him no matter what. I mean, it does look rather silly that he, he makes a distinction about the evils of mail-in ballot, but, you know, absentee vote is okay and it's the exact same process and i guess i find humor in many of these things um and maybe that's just me but 
he makes a distinction between the two. And the bottom line is there is no distinction between the two. Right. So, I think that I would laugh except for it's so scary and tragic. So it's hard to laugh. And you're right. the state like Oregon or Washington that have been doing mail-in ballots for, you know, a decade or more, or here in Hawaii with no problems at all. Of course, he doesn't pick any of those states. Right. You know, he just picks this one state. I'm surprised he didn't pick Georgia because he's got, you know, that secretary of state in the palm of his hand also. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for your comments on that. Winston, we only have a few minutes left in the show. I've got to talk about the South Manhattan District, the prosecutor, uh, Cyrus Vance Jr., who's expanded the, the scope from hush money. And I think we kind of knew this before, but now it's been formalized. Um, the hush money to Stormy Daniels and Miss um, uh, Karen McDougal um, and how that all happened. He now more or less has shown his cards that it's all about the fraudulent tax returns, most likely fraudulent, that um, inflates his values with the banks and insurance companies, yet underestimates his valuations on his properties to the IRS. Um, any thoughts about um, Mr. Vance's uh, kind of announcement at the podium about this? I think that it will be fine after Donald Trump is out of office and he can pursue whatever charges he wants. But as far as affecting election results or his base or anything else, this is one more thing that they will say this is politically motivated. It does, of course, he never cheated or lied, or even if he did, it's for the better good because we have this man in office who's advancing our own agendas or uh, whatever rationalizations it takes. I don't think it matters. They don't care. It, it does not matter. I think that what does matter, though, is, you know, in the Axios uh, um, interview where he said, you know, uh, the rationale was we have a new phenomenon called mail-in voting. And, you know, uh, what well, we've been voting absentee since the Civil War. Um, what's more troubling is when you have uh, Jim Clyburn, who's the uh, House Majority Whip, he said that he thinks that Donald Trump has no intention of peacefully transferring power um, and plans to install himself in some kind of emergency to continue to hold on to office. I don't think that will happen. Um, hopefully that we will just realize we've had enough. But the danger is that he activates um, people in, in a way that that is really detrimental to our nation. So I well, think you we know, need Joe Biden, Joe Biden said that about a week and a half ago. He just said it. I don't think he's going to leave peacefully. Um, two questions. Yeah. Yep. Number one, does um, does the southern Manhattan district get the tax returns? Number two is, is any of that information somehow exposed to the public to give us an indication whether or not uh, those tax returns are, are fraudulent? Well, someone will leak them somewhere and they will be fraudulent. You know, there's going to be information in there, but uh, it, it's not going to, it's not going to change anyone's minds. Just at this point, if you haven't figured it out, you're not going to figure it out. Honestly, it, it, from day one, from before he ever got into office, you know, <laughs> If you haven't figured it out by now, well, maybe yeah. I don't know. Let's keep let's keep working with our our good friends who are who did support Donald Trump, who may still be on the lines for whatever reasons, and just help them gently to understand. All righty, we need to save ourselves as a Thank nation. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. Real quick, we were in a lightning round here. Uh, predictions for the next week coming. Very quick answer, please. We're we're out of time, but I want to hear from all of us, all of you, uh, about your predictions. Go ahead, Winston. More of the same. More of the same. OK. Um, Cynthia? Oh, um, I think he's going to double down on all of his mail-in ballot. mail -in ballots are fraudulent. I think we're just going to hear more, like Winston said. Unfortunately, more of a big psychopath that's in office. Unfortunately, the classic narcissism is going to continue to show its ugly face. OK, thank you very much. Stephanie? I just think there are unforced errors that are starting to appear. And I think that those may increase and we should be on the lookout for those. And uh, hopefully um, there will even be some errors in his judgment that he's trying to change something. So um, like, like the election. 
But um, I think more and more uh, desperation is going to uh, peek through his um, ignorance and uh, make him do things that are uh, unacceptable, hopefully, because then that will inform, you know, the populace that it, it is it is a limited situation. And that's hopeless. more outrageousness to uh, let us forget what happened the week prior. All righty. I want to thank Winston, Cynthia, Stephanie. Oh, oh. I've just been uh, told we have a couple questions here, so if we have time. Uh, let's see what those questions are. What is the role of Ivanka and Jared in the presidency? No role definition means they can do anything. Are they manipulating him like a puppet? Are his, is his son-in-law and his daughter manipulating the president of the United States like a puppet? Uh, real quick, Winston, your answer. Um, I, I, they have a complicated relationship, but uh, I think that that she's just been manipulating the whole country along with everybody else in the regime right now. So I don't know about their re internal relationship, but she could have stopped him earlier. Maybe she has. Maybe the tell-all book could come out in 10 years and say how she stopped him from pressing the button or God knows what. Yeah. Jared, who knows? He's, he's a, we'll all find out in 10 years, hopefully five years. You know, um, the next question is kind of pertains to the Marion Antoinette uh, this goes to what uh, Ivanka said about try something different or try something new, which was uh, translated into um, Antoinette's refrain, let them eat cake. Um, does Trump actually believe what, what he says and is he just parroting what he's been given? Uh, let's go to Stephanie on that. Thank you. I wanted to say that I believe that is a good example of what's happening because Marie Antoinette did not understand that cake was different from bread and that if you didn't have bread, maybe you had cake. If you, she just didn't understand what cake required, like sugar, which was very, very expensive. And white bread, the flour was very expensive. So then you add in the cake and with sugar, and that was really out of line for people, whether they were starving to death or, or another. Anyway, I think it's emblematic of what we're getting with Trump. A lot of, he thinks a lot of stuff is cake and doesn't understand how it's different. I agree. All right, Winston, Cynthia, Stephanie, thank you very much for appearing on this week's Trump Week. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. Join us next week, Wednesday, 11 o'clock for Trump Week. Aloha. Aloha.